Welcome back to DK Sports Radio. This is Chris Carter, NFL analyst here at DKPittsburghSports.com, and you're listening to the Carter Six Pack. And here at the Carter Six Pack here on DK Sports Radio, we talk about the top six things in a topic. We break them down, we rank, we rate them, and we ask you to get at us about what you think. I'm Chris Carter, at Carter Critiques on Twitter, and we're going to stick with the Steelers today with our topic. Our topic right now for today are the top six Steelers free agent pickups. Yes, now, free agency, for those who don't know, officially began in the mood that it is in 1992. There technically were free agents before then, but it wasn't the same. There wasn't the competitive market that there has been since the early 90s. So we're going to stretch a little bit before Kevin Colbert as well. We're going to we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some guys that came before then. But most of them, well, basically all but one of them is going to be from the Colbert era. Let's get into it. Number six. six. Coming in at number six, the recent Steeler, D'Angelo Williams. D'Angelo Williams coming out of the Carolina Panthers was in his it is in the last legs of his career. He was coming off of being the the lightning of the Thunder Lightning package between him and Jonathan Stewart. Uh, he was a, he was a really good running back, and when he came into the Steelers, they said, "Look, you're coming in to purely be the replacement for Le'Veon Bell." Now he was 32 years old when they signed him back in 2015. But he ended up starting 10 games in his first season. He rushed for 200 200 times for over 900 yards, 11 touchdowns. That's the second most of his career. He revitalized himself um, that that year. He uh, he had a a run of 55 yards. He helped the Steelers get back to the playoffs. um, And and, uh, had it not been for a late-season injury, he would have been the guy in the playoffs that they would have relied upon uh, when they played the Bengals and eventually lost to the Broncos. But unfortunately, he, like Le'Veon Bell the previous year, suffered an injury at the end of the season and in his time. But in his time running for the Steelers, he rushed for 298 times for 1,250 yards and 15 touchdowns in just two seasons. That's impressive for a guy who was coming in for a backup on his hind legs of his career. Number five. five. Coming in at number five is a guy that added to the defensive line depth of the Steelers, and that's Kimo Von Olhoffen. Kimo Von Olhoffen used to be a Bengal. He was drafted back in 1994. Uh, He played for them until 1999, and then in 2000, he joined the Pittsburgh Steelers and became a regular starter for them. He only started five games the previous season with the Cincinnati Bengals, and they, they sent him on his way. He was a nose tackle for a little bit, backing up Casey Hampton. Then he became a 3-4 defensive end, and that's where he found his home for the team. He was a key player in stopping the run. He would pair up with Aaron Smith, and the two would become one of the best one-two punches, if not the best one-two punches of defensive ends in the league. They were run stoppers. They were pass rushers. Although the most sacks he ever got came in 2003 when he had eight sacks on the year. Now, that wasn't the the biggest year, of course, for the Pittsburgh because they went 6-10 and ten that year. But he asserted himself on the line. He made himself a, a, a reliable player. And in his final year with the team, he started all 16 games, had four passes defense, three and a half sacks, um, and 22 overall tackles. But, of course, he helped the team get to the Super Bowl and win it in 2005. He had a sack in the playoffs, but I know what everyone's going to say. Well, you can't talk about Kimo with what he did to Carson Palmer, which is one of the became one of the most controversial moments that – It was involved in a Steelers win in recent history. Uh, Early on in the game, Carson Palmer with his first pass dropped back and launched a bomb down the sideline. Uh, I think it was to Chris Henry, and it was was a a huge chunk of yards. But on the back end of the play, Kimo Von Olhoffen fell down and hit Carson Palmer in his knee. And it wasn't like he dove into him. He was fighting with an offensive lineman, and he fell he fell towards him. And immediately when he sees what happened, he gets up and he looks, oh, goodness, I can't believe that just happened. And that ended Carson Palmer's season. He was on a serious tear that year. The Bengals had won the division, which is why they were in Paul Brown Stadium hosting that game. And then John Kitna came in. He did pretty well for himself. He put up some points. They had a first-half lead, and then the Pittsburgh Steelers just took it over in the second half winning that game, and then going on to eventually win the Super Bowl. But Kino, Kimo von Olhoffen was every bit a part of that 2004-2005 defense that was definitely one of the best in the NFL. Number four. four. Number four coming in is a guy 
the oldest person. Well, I guess the person that, that goes back the furthest on this list, and that's outside linebacker Kevin Green. Yes, Kevin Green. You're like, how can he be so low? Well, let's look at what he what he did for the Steelers way back when. Now, Kevin Green, he was originally part of the Rams. He was back in 1985. He was brought onto their team. And then eventually he joined Bill Cowher Steelers in 1993 at the age of 31. And he would start all 16 games every year that he played for the Steelers. And he played for the Steelers from 1993 all the way to 1995. He was part of that team that went to the Super Bowl and lost to the Dallas Cowboys, also the team that lost to the San Diego Chargers. Um, But he he was a huge part of that Blitzburg defense that sort of resuscitated itself. He um, he had, in in his career, he had 160 sacks. 35 and a half of them came from 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 the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he teamed up with Greg Lloyd, for 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 a while, and that that two, those two defined blitzing in the NFL in the mid '90s. That's when I was a, a little bit little bitty toddler, and I knew I was like, man, those guys are for real. Greg Lloyd was the guy I think that drew a lot of attention because he talked a lot, but. Uh, Kevin Green was a Hall of Fame guy. He he finished his career with the third most sacks in NFL history. Um, he had 160 sacks. I mean that record still stands as the third most. He's uh, Julius Peppers chasing him. He has 154 and a half right now. Um, and Julius Peppers just keeps bouncing around the NFL. I don't know how, but he's right behind Reggie White, who had 198. Uh, but Kevin Green was every bit a part of that blitzing Steelers defense. I think the biggest thing that the, the biggest knock on Kevin Green is one, he didn't win a Super Bowl with him, and two, they didn't. He he wasn't really the, the supreme run stopper. He was just purely a pass rusher. But his best year, of course, came in 1994, not the year when the Steelers went to the Super Bowl. But he had 14 sacks that year. That was the most he had while he was with the Steelers. But while he was with the Steelers, he had 12 and a half in '93, 14 in '94, and then nine in '95. He would still keep he competing after he left the Steelers. He went to the Panthers in '96, where he had 14 and a half, and that wasn't even the most he had back in '88 and '89. He had back to back seasons with 16 and a half sacks. And um, even he would he would go on he would play for the Niners for a year, um, and he would uh, where, where he'd get ten and a half sacks. But he finished his career with four straight double digit sack seasons. And in his second to last career, at the age of thirty six, he had fifteen sacks. The guy's a freak of an athlete. Definitely deserves to be on this list. Number three. three. And coming in at number three is one that most Steelers fans will remember right off the top of their head, and it's Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark came in to play free safety at the age of 27 in 2006, the year before Mike Tomlin would officially join the team. Uh, not officially, he just joined the team. Uh, but he came in right after the Steelers won their Super Bowl. They were they asked him to replace Chris Hope, who was a part of that Super Bowl winning defense we talked about with Kima Von Ohoff. And Chris Hope was a hard-hitting safety that played for them, but they couldn't afford to keep him, uh, so they sent him on his way. And they brought in Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark initially started 12, 12 games that, that season in 2006. He had one interception. He wasn't really click, clicking just yet. He needed to develop that rapport with Troy Polamalu, who at, his, at that point was still very young in his career as well. But Ryan Clark would really start to key in for the Steelers' defense coming in coming into his own in the 2008, which was the Super Bowl season of Super Bowl 43. Then he would have six passes defensed, which would be the third most, or I'm sorry, the fourth most that he had in his time with the Steelers. Um, he had he had 52 tackles. He had an interception. Um, but most importantly, he probably had the biggest hit I have ever seen in a Steelers playoff game when he absolutely destroyed Willis McGahee in the AFC Championship game at Heinz Field. I mean, the, Willis McGahee catches a pass over the middle. The Steelers are up nine at this point. You know, Troy Polamalu has pretty much sealed the game. The Ravens haven't have only scored one touchdown the entire time, and Ryan Clark just comes and lays the boom. Both fall down. They both reach for their heads. Willis McGahee ends up getting carted off. Ryan Clark walks away. Um, he needs some help, of course, because he he was pretty hurt up. But Ryan Clark was that defining the define the the physical free safety position for the Steelers for many years. They picked him up in 2006. He went all the way to 2013. In his time with the Steelers, 
He had 109 starts, 12 interceptions, none of which were returned for touchdowns, but that wasn't his style. He sort of played back, played center field, and he played the enforcer over the middle that sort of enforced and said, hey, I'm bringing the footsteps. He forced three fumbles in his in his time with the Steelers, recovered six. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, is that he was that guy next to Polamalu. Their relationship and their chemistry was what helped define that Steelers secondary in the late 2000s going into the early 2010s. Um, and he would, he would still be a part of, the, uh, of those teams. In 2009, when Trey Pomona was gone, he had the most passive defense of eight. But in 2010, when the Steelers' defense was yet again ranked at the top of the league and they went back to the Super Bowl, he was every bit a part of it with seven passes defense, two interceptions. And if you'd remember, he had a huge interception on Joe Flacco um, early early on, in the uh, not, not early on, but in the second half of the AFC Divisional Round playoffs, that's when he, they started turning the game around. He also um, he also stripped Ray, Ray Rice at one point. Lots of big plays. Ryan Clark deserving of number three. Number two. And coming in at number two is none other than Jeff Harding. Now, that was that, that might not have been the guy that you thought would be ranked up so high. How is he ranked ahead of Kevin Green, the all-time leading sack guy? Well, listen, listen, listen. It's about what Harding's meant to the Steelers. Kevin Green was great because he had a long history of things, but to the Steelers, Jeff Harding's it's, it brought, brought another level of importance. Think about it this way. From when Chuck Knoll came in, he had Ray Mansfield at center. They drafted Mike Webster in 74. He became a starter in the, you know, for the Steelers back in the 70s. Then he was a starter for a long time. Then that Pat, and he was a Hall of Fame. Some say he was the greatest center, greatest offensive lineman of all time. Then they passed that, that mantle off to Dermani Dawson, who some people say he was the greatest center of all time. Dermani Dawson carried that, carried that to 2000. And that was a serious thing. Pittsburgh centers were for real. That was back-to-back Hall of Famers that held it for over thirty over thirty years. You think about nineteen sixty-four. I guess uh, I guess twenty-five years would be more accurate. But from nineteen sixty-four to two thousand, all they had was Ray Mansfield, Mike Webster, and Dermonte Dawson. So who does Kevin Colbert go out and get? Jeff Harding's. Now Jeff Harding comes in in, in two thousand one. Um, and he he ended his time with the Steelers in 2006, but he was from the Detroit, the Detroit Lions. Um, they signed him after the Steelers went nine and seven under Bill Cowher, and then that next year they went 13 and three. And uh, in 2001, he started every game all the way to the AFC Championship game. Um, he also started every game from 2003 to 2005. Um, he was a Pro Bowler only two of those years. But here's the thing. Jeff Harding's established the middle of, of that offensive line that allowed Jerome Bettis, Amos Zaraway, eventually Willie Parker to get things going. He worked next to Alan Fanica. Those two were a d- dynamic one-two punch that defined the Steelers' running game for so many years and helped Willie Parker get his career going. And then he was a huge part of that Super Bowl Forty team and how the offensive line not only set the tone in the ground game but protected Ben Roethlisberger, Jeff Harding's number two. Before we give you the number one, let's do let's do a recap real quick. Number six was D'Angelo Williams, the old running back that came and lit it up in his 30s. Number five was Kimo Von Allhoffen because he gave chemotherapy to Carson Palmer. Number four was Kevin Green, the third all-time leading sack man in the history of the NFL. Number three was Ryan Clark, the man who defined the footsteps position at free safety for the Steelers for many years. Number two was Jeff Harding, the center that followed Damarne Dawson and led the Steelers' offensive line and Willie Parker and Jerome Bettis that drove the, the, the Steelers' offense for, for quite some time. And now we reach number one. Number one. Number one free agent signing in Pittsburgh Steelers history has to be James Farrier. Now you look at James Farrier. This man is it, he came in he was probably the the key signing that helped build that mid to that, that mid to late 2000s Steelers defense. He came off of being with the Jets for his rookie contract. He played for them for what, 5 years? Yes, 5 years and he played and then the Steelers brought him in in 2002. He started 14 games there, but he became and at first people were like, "What is this guy doing?" And you look at his numbers. He defines of why why I tell Pittsburgh Steelers fans often wait to see how a free agent player plays out. 
just because he doesn't do well in his first year doesn't mean he won't grow into his position. People doubted him in two in two thousand two. He only had sixty tackles. People were looking like, what's that? That's that's not enough. He didn't he didn't force a fumble. He had one pass defensed. He didn't have an interception. And then in two thousand three, he started to click. He had an interception. He had four passes defensed. He started he started to make some plays. Didn't have a sack. But in two thousand four, you really started to see him take over. He had four interceptions, one return for a touchdown. This guy, and that's that he had his first three sacks for the team that year. But he came this became the centerpiece of this defense for the Steelers. He worked next to Larry Foote, an inside linebacker. He would call all the signals, relay all the information. As Dale Lolly, his opinion about James Ferrier. Dale Lolly thinks that someday James Ferrier needs to be in the Hall of Fame because of how important he was to that Steelers defense. He played for the Steelers for 10 years. 10 years. Started 154 games with 8 interceptions. That one touchdown in 2004 was his only return touchdown. But he was a key part of what made Steelers defensive football under Dick LeBeau. And fun fact, if you never knew, he always, if there was a night game that the Steelers were playing, you could always catch him with Dick LeBeau at Pamela's Restaurant getting some good breakfast in the morning. Most people didn't know that. I, I, there was a few times you could see him in Oakland, but that was their tradition. Those two have a really strong relationship. And James Ferrier had a strong relationship with the entire Steelers defense. He retired at the age of 36, playing for a long time for the Steelers. You got to think that's a, that's an era. James Ferrier has to be your top guy, especially because he was on both the Super Bowl teams of the 2000s in the Bill Cowher era and then in the Mike Tomlin era, passing the torch off to Lawrence Timmons. So that's why James Ferrier is your number one free agent signing in Pittsburgh Steelers history. That was the Carter Six Pack. Thank you for listening, and and be sure to chime in. You can hit me up at at Carter Critiques on Twitter if you think that I got anything wrong. If you think Kevin Green deserves to be hired because he had more sacks. If you think that, oh, wait a minute, what about Moeldy Moore? I did think, I did consider Moeldy Moore because he was a huge part of that 2008 team that led to the Super Bowl. But looking at importance to the team, these are the top six guys I had. Thanks for listening to the Carter Six Pack here on DK Pittsburgh Sports. Be sure to keep listening to DK Sports Radio for more great content. This has been Chris Carter, signing out.